So folks know I'm Lynn Hoyce. I work with the Local Foods Program at Iowa State Extension. And this is one of our series of peer-to-peer -peer calls um, on topics that folks are interested in learning about and then talking about amongst themselves and with folks who, who do this in their work too. And, and Paul and Jennifer um, have worked with farmers markets for quite some time and they were uh, willing to join us on this call. So um, I will go ahead and turn it all over to Paul and then at, at the appropriate time, Paul, you can go ahead and introduce Jennifer. And this is being recorded and I will send this out along with anything, any handouts or information that Paul and Jennifer have too. So welcome, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you, Lynn. And I hope everybody can hear me. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here and I'm glad that Lynn gave me the opportunity to speak to you all today. I guess my um, laptop doesn't have visual, the camera isn't working or set up right, so you won't be able to see me, but, but I do have some slides that I just wanted to go over. And with me today is Jennifer DeFoss, and she is a market manager over in the Muscatine area. Jennifer just stepped off the Iowa Farmers Market Association board, but she's a, a great resource and We've collaborated on a couple of things, and I thought she'd be a great addition to this. Um, as a little background on myself, um, I'll, I'll do that, and then I'll go into some slides. And then after that, I thought I'd introduce Jennifer, and she can talk a bit about herself, and then we'll help answer some questions that have come our way and any questions you might have to share with us. So, um, so my background, I've been with the Iowa Department of Agriculture for about 10 years now. And beginning in 2010, I became the administrator of the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program for the department. And for those that aren't familiar with that program, it's a program that allows uh, eligible WIC and senior folks to receive $3 vouchers for use at authorized farmer's markets for the purchase of locally grown fresh produce. So I did that for about five years, and then two or three years ago, I became the state horticulturist for the department. And so I, I still work closely with farmers markets. I'm an ex officio member of the Iowa Farmers Market Association and um, uh, enjoy working with markets very much. Uh, we do have a farmers market on Capitol Hill, the Capitol Complex Farmers Market, and I am a co-chair and co-manager there. So I do have uh, that hat too. I go and, and help manage that market. We have that on Tuesdays at over the noon hour, a couple hours there uh, during the growing season. So with that, I'm gonna open up my slides. Yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen here and hopefully what I want is there. I don't see it. So, let's see. Bear with me. Maybe I have to go back out. If I minimize, let's see if this thing is open. Now I've kind of lost the... For those who are just joining us, we're just um, getting started, so you haven't missed anything. And Paul's working on sharing the screen for his presentation, so. There we go. Are you starting to see something? Yep. Okay. We've got it. Great. So right, I just wanted to touch on a, a few things. Some, some of these things I'm sure you've you've heard, but I hope you'll pick up something in in my little spiel here that will be of value, and you can take back to your communities that you work with. Um, but uh, the the department really appreciates all the local food coordinators and folks in extension and what they do out there and helping um, with farmers markets and all the other tasks that you do, but. I, I was thinking about this 
topic and I thought of some resources that are of value to farmers market, some more obvious than others. Um, and you can see some that I've listed here. And so I'll touch briefly on each of those as we go through these slides. But before we do that, I thought it would be fun to just step back and think about farmers markets in Iowa and, and just a, a general overview of the markets. Um, I don't know if I'm savvy enough to read right now any answers you might have, but what do you think about the number of farmers markets in the state? Um, I get that question from time to time. How many markets are actually in the state? Um, and the uh, the short and sweet answer is actually we really don't know. <laughs> um, when it comes to farmers markets in Iowa, they don't have to register with the state. Um, so we don't know per se how many are out there. They typically um, would work with their local communities to to set up and that. But what we do know are those markets, for the most part, that participate in the Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Those markets have to be authorized with us to participate. And in any given year, there are about 120 to 130 of those. So we estimate beyond that, and there are maybe uh, – you know, another um, 60 to 70 of those. So maybe about 200 farmers markets in the state that are working every growing season. We did a, a, a study in 2009, an independent study. We hired it out using money through the specialty crop block grant system to look at farmers markets. And we got a lot of valuable information on, on markets at that time including the average age of shoppers, um, put a guess in your head, but what the study came out to be was 54 years of age. And so I know one of the questions that Lynn did share with me had to do with getting younger people. And so we'll touch on that, Jennifer and I, after, after my, my slides here. But yeah, right now, or at least back then, the, the age was 54 for an average shopper. The average age of vendors, turned out to be a little bit more. It was 57 years of age. So that's a struggle too with markets is how to get new folks in. Um, in part that that age reflects perhaps that retired folks can participate as vendors more easily in markets. Um, but there's always an interest in getting younger people involved and that is a challenge. The items most purchased, this is a broad category, and you probably guess that's, that's fruits and vegetables. That's the most popular thing people go to when they go to the farmer's markets. That's followed by uh, baked goods. That would be the second most popular item to go purchase at the market. Um, and then the next bullet there, or question, we had uh, that study looked at, at the growth of farmers markets, and we did see a tremendous growth in Iowa over the 15 years from 94 to 2009. Um, it actually, the markets increased 70% during that, that period. So it's still a rather new phenomenon in Iowa, uh, these markets, and uh, the, the continued existence of these markets is testament to their popularity in Iowa. Sales in dollars in 2009 was estimated at um, $33.4 million. So a lot of, of dollars are going out there uh, and being spent at the markets. And then I was ranking back in 2009 per capita, we were landing fourth in the nation for the number of markets. So it, they are they are used in Iowa. They're popular in Iowa. I would say we're I would say we're still in the top ten in the nation, uh, probably more like uh, seventh or eighth in the nation, uh, just because other states were catching up to us. I think, uh, but a, a very popular pastime uh, to do is go visit your local farmers market. So just thought I'd touch on that to give you a general overview. And then I'm going to jump into thinking about some resources that we all want to consider when we're trying to help establish or strengthen our local farmers markets. The most obvious and probably the most important, of course, are the producers, the vendors out there that participate in the markets. Um, the most critical piece of a market 
and sometimes the most challenging part of that market as well. Vendors, for the most part, are great folks, but as we all know, they come in in all walks of life, all different personalities, um, but they are a great resource. Uh, They can be a challenge sometimes to uh, to coordinate and get uh, to participate your the way you're hoping but uh, by and large they're they're a great asset they're fun to be around and we couldn't do it without them but I do have some suggestions you know when they're basic but they're things to think about and that you know get to know your market vendors Um, the more you get to know them the more you'll know their strengths and you can tap into those strengths to help you uh, develop the market and get other vendors to participate. So think about your market from their eyes. Think about their strengths and how you can tap into those. Um, manage their workspace. And along that line, think about developing clear and concise rules. And I'll touch upon that later. But rules and a sheet that they can sign that they've seen these rules and will abide by them is very critical. It really goes a long way to developing a good market. And then be on site with them. There are markets out there where the manager is not a vendor and you don't have to be a vendor, but they don't participate. They don't go to the markets or they go every third time or something like that. And the vendors tell me that that is, uh, uh, they share with me when, when that happens, they would like to see managers be on site during the market hours. They really appreciate that. And it helps with uh, managing the personalities and the development of the market as it goes through the hours so that it's open. And then celebrate with them. It's a great idea to have some something at the end of the season to celebrate the market success for that year. You know, a potluck is an easy thing to do and everybody probably would want to participate. So I urge folks that are involved with uh, managing markets to celebrate at the end of the year with their vendors. Moving on to another great resource, of course, are are the managers and the the key personnel out there that are the volunteers or the staff that help that manager, the board members, if there's a board. Um, If you're looking for ideas, market managers are a great resource. And you can tap into market managers in nearby communities. Think about those that you, you admire, those markets around your market if you're looking for new ideas. Go over and visit and and get to know that market manager. Or if you want to reach out through phone or email, we have a great resource online at the Iowa Department of Agriculture. Um, We have a directory of all the markets that we know of in any given growing season, um, and we list them. So there are typically over 150 markets listed on this directory, and you can find it on our website. And on the far right of that directory, you can see in a red circle there I've I've got that we have manager contact information, phone number, email. Um, You can sort this directory by uh, county or by city. Um, So this, I think, is a great resource for those that are are looking for new ideas and want to reach out to um, other markets. Use this directory to get some contact information. Think about your local civic leaders, the city officials. Um, You probably are heavily involved. You're probably uh, a volunteer, or if not, you're an extension or uh, uh, closely aligned line of work, and you're a great resource yourself. But think of others like you in the community that could help. Um, Social media is, is pretty critical these days. And I know Jennifer's got some great ideas when it comes to that. But if you aren't online already with social media, you really should be and try to actively use it, keep it updated, uh, try to reach out to broaden who it goes to and who it touches. Um, uh, a website, too, is, is pretty critical in addition to that social media outlet, I think, and is a valuable tool. Thinking outside the box, too, who else can you reach out to? Think about senior centers, um, the WIC clinics in the area. Those are great resources to tap into. The city officials, you might just be surprised if you haven't. You might find some really good uh, allies 
on city council or the mayor might love farmers markets and want to help. Um, and of course, the extension offices can't say enough of great things about uh, the offices of, throughout the state and uh, what they do and a great resource and outlet. And then, of course, community health departments are another way to, to think about markets and what you can broadcast using those health departments. Uh, so just some ideas for, for outreach, if you will. When it comes to state resources, I, uh, I wanted to point out some things. You know, we do have some extensive uh, resources on the Iowa Department of Agriculture website. If you go to that website and click on programs, you can come to Farmer's Market and you'll find some, some resources there. We have developed uh, uh, a manual that helps walk folks through developing a Farmer's Market. It's a rather exhaustive manual, but it's there online and you can print it out. Um, it walks you through the first meetings, you know, of gathering interested people to, um, to the full-fledged market up and running, um, thinking about setting up a board and incorporating and market rules. It's, you don't have to follow everything in that manual, but it will give you a lot of great ideas to think about as you move forward in developing a market or strengthening an existing market. Then I also wanted to mention that we do have a smartphone app out there. If you go to your smartphone, uh, you know, uh, app site and just type in Iowa Farmers Market, this should pop up uh, an opportunity to download a free app that will allow you to look at farmers markets in your area. You can do searches by five, 10, 20 miles, or by county, city, that kind of thing. And it will pop up all the markets that are, that are listed in that directory that I showed you, that online directory from the previous screen. So any changes we make on that online directory are immediately reflected in this app. So that's a great resource, not only for yeah, probably you folks, but also customers as well. Farmers Market Nutrition Program is, is housed within the Iowa Department of Agriculture, and that's a great program for markets to consider. Um, Iowa was one of the first 10 pilot states for both the WIC and Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Programs, and uh, it's a very strong program in Iowa, and a lot of other states turn to Iowa as an example for that program. So we're proud of that program, uh, but we're always open to suggestions, and but if you want to learn more about it, contact me or, or look for some contact information coming up about our administrator of that program, Stephanie Groom. And then the, the program or the department does, does periodically send out emails to uh, uh, market managers about training events. And we also touch bases with uh, vendors in the state about training and, and other opportunities. Here's some contact information. Um, you can see my phone number and my email address. Hopefully it's coming through there all right. Um, the Iowa Department of Agriculture does have other folks that are a little more expert on things when it comes to certain items that are sold at farmer's markets. So if, if there are questions about using weights and, and scales at, market man, at farmer's markets or meat and poultry sales, dairy products, pet foods, those kinds of things. If you call our main office number, they'll direct you to the right person that can answer those questions a little bit better than I. They'll be the final authority on that, if you will. The FMNP refers to Farmer's Market Nutrition Program and that it, uh, I did administrate that, so I, I'd be happy to answer questions, but Stephanie Groom is the administrator and there's her phone number. A couple of other departments to think about outside of the Department of Agriculture. The Iowa Department of Human Services is, is the department that handles electronic-based transfer machines. These are the machines that uh, take uh, the SNAP benefit cards, but they also take credit and debit cards. So Tracy Penick over there, and there's her phone number, can answer questions about that program 
She's happy to work with vendors that want to acquire those machines. And there's been, I believe the state picks up the transaction fees when it comes to the SNAP benefits. Um, so SNAP benefits are now electronic uh, in the state and they can be um, accessed at farmers markets with these, these EBT machines. Then, of course, a lot of questions center around what can I sell at a farmer's market um, and that, that might require licensing. This, the, the final authority on these kinds of questions are handled by a bureau, the, the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau, and that's within the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals. Um, you know, I can try to answer some of these questions, but the final authority would be Kurt Ruber over there, and there's his phone number, um, and he he has an exhaustive knowledge of all these things in his head, and he's a great resource for me as well. Um, but when it comes to, do I need a license to sell my salsas? Uh, what do I need to do to have a, a recipe evaluated before I can sell those kinds of foodstuffs? Um, is this uh, a product that needs temperature control or not. Those kinds of questions would be handled by the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau. And then lastly, the Iowa Department of Revenue um, always has its hand out, if you will, for anything that might be taxable that's being sold at a farmer's market. Just a few more additional state contacts. You've probably all heard about the Food Safety Modernization Act. And uh, that was a, uh, uh, an act passed by a bipartisan Congress back in 2011 and signed by the president, President Obama then. And then since that time, the actual rules have been uh, developed after the act was passed. And there are seven foundational rules of that act, and one of them is the produce safety rule. And that's come into play just beginning last year, and it's, um, it hasn't been fully implemented yet, but it will affect produce growers in the state. And I am one of the contact people in the state for that rule and, and trying to understand it, as is Angela Shaw up at ISU. She and I are, sort of the head of what we call the Iowa Produce Safety Team. It's a great set of ISU Extension folks along with me and, and Maury Wills at ISU, or at the Iowa Department of Agriculture. And so we can answer any questions on, on what growers need to do to be in compliance with that rule. The Iowa Sensitive Crops Directory is another great resource for growers of sensitive crops, they can actually trace out the boundaries of their crops on this online platform or drop down onto this, this web-based mapping system where their beehives might be. And then uh, pesticide applicators would go to this website and see where those sites are before they spray in that area. So it's a way to spread uh, the information between these two parties about these sensitive crop areas and beehives. And then lastly, the Double Up Food Bucks program is another uh, new program in the state. Last year was its first full year. And Aaron McLaren over at the Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative um, handles that program. And they have used what's called a, a, a FINI grant, a federal grant to uh, access dollars to, to fund that program, whereby uh, SNAP holders would have this double up food bucks card in addition to their SNAP benefits. And at select markets, they can actually double the purchasing power of their SNAP card. So if they buy $30 worth of SNAP benefit uh, groceries, they could double that to 60 with this double up program uh, card. They don't, you know, their, their supplies, their, their dollar supplies are limited, but I believe they're they're moving to 10 or a dozen markets this year in the state. And if you go to their website, there's even a, a link there to fill out an application where markets can apply uh, for these dollars. But check out that website and learn more information about that program. State organizations, I wanted to touch bases on too. The Iowa Farmers Market Association has been around since 2002 and the Iowa Department of Agriculture actually got the, 
the the first board members together in a room and signed the documents to incorporate. So uh, it's near and dear to our hearts, this association. Um, and one of the big things they do is, a, is an annual workshop, um, but they also offer advice. If you go to their website, there's a place to enter a question, and then one of the board members will try to answer that for who's ever asking the question, or they might you know, occasionally send things my way for me to answer. But uh, if you have questions about um, um, how to, you know, best practices or challenges, you know, these board members are living and breathing farmers markets, and they're more than happy to help. And I know Jennifer would be more than happy to help too. She she fielded a lot of those questions when she was on the board. There's also um, a great resource link on on the IFMA Iowa Farmers Market Association website that shows PDF files of previous of presentations from previous workshops and also links to uh, market rules from different communities in Iowa. They have sent in many communities or a few anyway have sent in market rules to me or to Jennifer or to others and then we post these on the IFMA website. So you can click on those links and see what kind of market rules other communities uh, have in place. And it's a great resource for comparing your market rules or if you're developing a new market to see what kind of market rules they are, are having their vendors consider before they participate in those markets. The Iowa Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association is another great organization more geared towards the actual growing of produce and sharing and networking with with each other on the ins and outs and do's and don'ts of 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 marketing and growing produce and they have a winter workshop as well these two groups have just recently gotten together along with some other groups to to think about planning a uh, a workshop a joint workshop uh in 2020 so that's kind of exciting uh it was about 10 years ago these two groups did have a joint conference but they want to do it again and maybe include some other groups too and it would be a two-day affair um, at least and they're looking forward to developing that so i just wanted to share that with you all and then national organizations many of you are probably aware of the farmers market coalition it's a great resource to go to they have what's called a library there that you can click on and find all sorts of information from how best practices throughout the country to uh, tips on thinking about insurance and what to look for in insurance and where to go for insurance, these kinds of things. Um, just a wealth of information there. The National Sustainable Agricultural Coalition is another one. Um, and then I want to mention the National Association of Farmers Market Nutrition Programs is a great advocate. They're not as well known, but it, they, they are an advocate. They have a lobby, uh, an executive director that goes to D.C. and tries to educate uh, um, the, uh, the legislators there on the ins and outs of the program and the benefits of these programs for those that might need a little assistance in purchasing produce at farmers markets so that is it Lynn for me uh, 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 for my presentation part part of this um, maybe now would be a great time to ask Jennifer to say a few things yes, hi. Um, okay. <laughs> my name is Jennifer DeFossi and I have been a market manager for five years I've also been a vendor at farmers markets. I've shopped farmers markets for 20 years. I have had the opportunity to manage a 20 year old market that was really struggling with some issues. And I've also had the opportunity to create a new market in a small community. So I have some various experiences. And of course, as Paul mentioned, I served on the IFMA board of directors and that was a really fantastic experience. 
Um, let's see. Paul, should we dive into questions, or how do you want to do this? Oh, we sure could. Is that what you would suggest, Lynn? Yeah, why don't we? And for folks on the line, um, as, as most of you, maybe all of you know, we did ask for questions on the registration. So um, to honor the folks who were able to do that, I think we'll go ahead and let Paul and Jennifer answer those. But if you have additional questions or question, you didn't have a chance to do that when you registered, um, go ahead and send us something through the chat chat room, uh, the chat component, or just wait until there's a break and you can um, speak up. But we'll go ahead and get started on the questions that were submitted. So yeah, Paul and Je uh, Jennifer, just go ahead and choose the ones however you think will be best. Okay. Well, Jennifer, I'll just jump in here to, to start with. And I highlighted sure. a few that have to do more with uh, kind of this this thinking of what can I what can a vendor sell without requiring a license um, or what can they share um, without uh, the food and safe food and consumer safety bureau stepping in or what where should when do they need to turn to the food and consumer safety bureau or reach out to the state for some guidance and so. Uh, I'm looking at one question here. It says, I would like to know what laws or concerns I should be aware of concerning fermented foods such as cheese. And, um, you know, if you're selling commercial, commercially uh, processed cheese that's sold, um, there, that's fine. There, there is no law required there to sell that cheese if it's commercially um, produced. If you're, if you're making, say, a spread from cheese, or you're making your own cheese, or anything else you're making that requires fermentation, then you would need to go uh, and check with the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau and Kurt Ruber for those kinds of products. So anything fermented on the farm would be under regulation. Um, if you're using milk that is raw and not pasteurized, then you would also need to go to the Dairy Bureau, call them, and that's within the Iowa Department of Agriculture. If you're using pasteurized milk, you wouldn't need to, but, but if it's raw, the Dairy Bureau would need to get involved, so you'd want to contact them. And um, another question along those lines, rules on food demonstrations with samples of the food prepared offered rules on food samples other than say must be cut at the farmer's market. So to get along with that, touch bases on that, um, get on the right page here. Paul, another, kind of another one along the same lines, um, is this just to throw in for you and Jennifer is can, can there be a booth for kids to sell lemonade at the market? So when you're just so you, before you get mm -hmm. off that topic. So. Sure. And it's my understanding that that's fine, so long as it's it's health, you know, it's clean, and um, everything looks, you know, you know, you're handling the product in a in a cleanly manner. It's fine to sell lemonade. It's a, um, you may run afoul of of kids under the age of is it 16 or 14. Uh, the, the, with the child labor laws. That's one thing that, that may be a, a little sticking point. So you want to be cognizant of the age of the child when they're selling anywhere, you know, in the state, not just farmer's markets. But, uh, um, and along the same question here, there was part of that was uh, erroneous and uh, uh, pepper jams and salsas and Ronia products and why can't those be sold at a farmer's market? Well, they can be sold at a farmer's market, but because of the the nature of these products, the acidity level, I guess that leads to them to be potentially hazardous if they're not handled correctly. So based on their pH and the water content of these products, um, they're considered non-standard foods and the recipes for these kinds of products have to be evaluated. And so you would want to contact the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau to get information on how 
those products can be evaluated for you then to be able to sell at the farmer's market. But they are sold at the farmer's market, uh, but they have to be evaluated prior to that. And that's true for a lot of food. So say you want to have a chili contest at the farmer's market. Well, because so many ingredients might be homemade in that chili, um, the, the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau would have to get involved with that. It's just there are too many ingredients in, in you know, too many people participating that it, it just raises a red flag with the Bureau when it comes to food safety. Um, a lot of a lot of things, though, don't need to be uh, run by the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau. Um, but if you're home canning, that would be a flag to yourself that, yes, I need to have that conversation with that bureau to make sure that what I'm doing is okay. Um, and there again, it, the evaluation of that recipe may just give you a green light to go ahead. Uh, but anything that includes canning um, or with a lot of ingredients like chili, would, you would want to run that through the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau and talk to Kurt Ruber. Paul, um, another yeah. question along the food line um, from our question and answer folks. What kinds of permits would someone need to sell fresh applesauce, not canned? Mm -hmm. Well, the applesauce is processed. And so, um, I would, I would think you would need to call the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau and just have that conversation with them. Um, it depends on what you're adding to the applesauce. If there's nothing added, it's probably fine. Um, or you may just need to keep it, um, uh, you know, on ice at 41 degrees or less. Um, it's likely that's the only case, but I would want to check with the Food and Consumer Safety Bureau. They're the final authority on something like that. And a note from one of our um, folks that is listening, um, Shannon Coleman at ISU developed a very helpful series of publications that refer potential vendors and producers to the relevant rules and regulations that may apply to their particular products. And John, uh, this is John from... Um, um, Marshalltown um, Jasper, I think, John. Um, anyway, he has the link in the chat box. So if people are able to go there, you'll be able to find that. If not, that can be um, one of the pieces of information that I include when we send out our survey. So I will make sure. Yeah, that is a great, that, that is a great resource. So I've seen familiar. those and Good. they're really a nice thing to, to look at and, and grab a copy of. Yeah, that's great, John. Um, cooking classes, I thought I'd just touch briefly on that. Cooking classes are not regulated for sampling, but it's, um, if, if they're selling food, then the vendor or the market will need a license for that. So that's even true if there's a tip jar or donations. Uh, it's, those are viewed as a sale. But if they're just handing out sampling samples during a cooking class or sampling uh, of watermelons or cut peaches, that's fine. Um, you are supposed to have a temporary hand washing station nearby and any cut fruit needs to be on ice at 41 degrees or lower, but the, there's no license required. Paul, another um, lemonade question. Um, it's the question is usually lemonade would be sold by the cup in an individual serving. Would tax need to be charged? Hmm. I don't believe so. No, no, it's considered a food, so no. Okay. And I have another question. It's not along the food line, though. So when you get to um, I. I think I'm done with those those I've out you know that you handed me Lynn or sent okay. to me that were printed. Well, so I'll share ahead. this. I'll share this one from off online, and then you can go through some of the others. But this is from Emily, who says I've recently started working for a small market that's loosely organized. That is a loosely organized nonprofit. They would like to apply for a 501c3 status. Are there resources available to farmers markets for this, and what are the costs involved? 
Um, well, no, actually, there are, there are no resources for farmers markets. Um, it's just like any entity that wants to to a, to do a 501c3 status, they would have to apply for it, fill out the application and apply for it. You know, if you had some questions, you could call me at some time. I have done this before. Um, so, but there aren't any just resources per pertaining particularly to farmers markets for that status. Um, if you hired a lawyer or somebody to do this, there would be added costs involved. I'm drawing a blank on on costs for submitting these applications, if, if there is one. Cost. Jennifer, have you ever done this or do you? Yeah. Do Actually, you... I for both of the markets that I have been affiliated with, we did not have the money to um, apply. <laughs> we didn't have the money at all to hire an attorney. So what we did is we worked with a local organization and kind of piggybacked off of their 501c3 so that we could apply for grants. In Muscatine, we have a community foundation, and we were able to apply for local grants through them. And then I also, in the West Liberty, Iowa farmers market, we worked with an organization, a nonprofit that already had their 501c3, and C3, and um, we were able to apply for grants that way as well. So if you don't have the resources to apply for that yourself, it, you can always partner up. And that's something I do a lot with both markets is find an organization to work with and that is mutually beneficial to both of you. And I was thinking it was about 400 and I see somebody, Michael is confirming that, yeah, it's a $400 fee. So it is a little pricey. But. And he said that's just the application, not any legal fees that could be incurred. So yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, those are the only questions so far. Then, Paul, if you if you guys want to go back to okay. the list, too. Um, here's a question. I'm interested in knowing how to teach our families on SNAP benefits and how this can tie in with the farmer's markets. And I, I think I touched a bit on this in one of the slides. The Iowa Department of Human Services handles SNAP benefits um, okay. and where they, they will take those benefits. Um, the vendors that have the EBT machines that can handle SNAP will have a, they'll have a sign up um, and it says we accept um, and then it shows the actual card and it has Iowa on the side of the card. So look for a rather large sign at vendors that will be able to take this, the SNAP benefits at farmers markets. Now having said that, uh, a newer development in the state that ties in with the Double Up Food Bucks program is that most of the pro most of the markets that participate in that program have gone to a single EBT machine for the whole market, a central EBT machine. Um, so you may find individual vendors at that at those markets that have the machines, but but the Double Up Food Bucks markets, all but one, I think, have a central. EBT machine where they actually um, swipe SNAP benefit cards and the Double Up Food Bucks cards, and then they they hand out tokens that the customers then go around to the the uh, the vendors and use the tokens to purchase what they want, and then the vendors at the end of the market day go and exchange those tokens for cash or electronic uh, benefit transfer through to their their checking accounts, if you will. Um, so, um, Jennifer, you have anything on that? Other than just to promote it heavily, one we yeah. saw a huge jump in participation when we started promoting it on social media. A lot of people just weren't aware that mm -hmm. it was even op an option. So. Yeah. So yeah, definitely make your make the folks that have SNAP benefits aware that they can use them at, at farmers markets. Almost most farmers markets anymore have a vendor, at least one, that can take these SNAP benefits. So let's see. Can you touch on the difference between SNAP versus WIC and senior coupons? Um, some vendors want to 
to know if you take SNAP, can you automatically take WIC and senior coupons? And the answer is no. The SNAP requires that EBT machine. And then the WIC and senior coupons is, is part of the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program. And that's a separate program. The vendors for that program have to go through training and, and, and agree to abide by certain rules that they will only take these $3 vouchers for the purchase of fresh, locally grown produce. The SNAP benefits can be used a little more broadly in what they purchase. But just because a vendor can take SNAP benefits does not mean that they can take the WIC and Senior. You might find vendors that can do both, uh, but don't just assume that. There are signs that they post for both programs, so look for those signs um, at, their, at their place of business, whether it's a farm stand or a vendor stall. They are supposed to post signs that they can accept those. Let's see, we had a, a, a question on liability insurance. What exactly do we need to cover? What does our liability insurance not cover? Um, things along those lines. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not an insurance agent. I, I, I urge markets and vendors to get insurance, but I really suggest that they contact whoever their insurance carriers are to ask these harder questions, these more detailed questions. Certainly liability insurance is a good thing to have and maybe some, some insurance on any property that you might have at your place of business. Um, the, uh, the Iowa Farmers Market Association last year did work with Farm Bureau to get um, a package for farmers markets to purchase um, uh, insurance at a at a, a competitive reduced rate, and you can find more information about that on the IFMA website. So I urge you to look at that as an option for getting insurance. Um, a lot of markets that are within city limits will go to the city fathers to see if they can be added on to the the city's insurance as a rider, and that often works for markets. Jennifer, do you have insights on that? You might. We have, we do not go through our city's insurance. We're not on their mm -hmm. rider. We have our own insurance and it costs around, mm -hmm. it, well, exactly $250 a year. We, um, our insurance provider does not require that all of our vendors have their own insurance. Some insurance companies do. So what we have done, and I really recommend it, is we got an attorney, we had an attorney write us up a hold harmless agreement stating that, you know, our vendors recognize that they should be getting their own insurance and that the market is not liable for anything that should result from a lack of insurance on their part. So. Great. So, okay, well, Paul, can I address ahead. the question about the um, the growers that might not grow their own produce? Sure. Because <laughs> I have a lot of personal experience with this. So, one of the questions was about a new market that is struggling. They don't want to exclude vendors that aren't necessarily growing their produce, but maybe buying their produce. Mm. And this is something that Paul knows. I have talked to Paul on this. It's was a real struggle. I inherited a 20 year old market that had a 70% rule. And that means that 70% of the produce that was being sold by any specific vendor had to be homegrown, but the other 30% could be resale. Like for instance, the produce that was bought at an auction. So my advice, well, first of all, that was a nightmare. I can't even tell you what a nightmare it is to try to enforce a percentage rule. I would never recommend that. But as far as a new market, I would say that a 100% homegrown rule is the single most important rule a market can have because anything else is impossible to enforce. And it leads to so many hard feelings between vendors, a lot of animosity, because one thing I found was that um, some of our vendors that were buying their produce, they could actually sell but the tomato at significantly lower cost and still make a profit than our actual farmers could. So that caused a lot of hard feelings between vendors. 
I would also say, do not look at this. It is a struggle. I'm certain that, you know, starting up a new market, it's going to be a struggle. It always is to find vendors, but you can get through it and you will be happier for it because this rule, 100% homegrown, it's also a question of your market's integrity. Most customers shopping at a farmer's market, it would never occur to them that to even ask the question, did you grow this? Most customers will assume that the person selling the produce is the person who grew that produce. So one thing that I found when, as we were making the transition from having that 70-30 rule into 100% homegrown is use it as an opportunity to educate the public. We talked about crop failures. You know, if one year we got just hit by um, squash bugs really badly and we didn't have any zucchini to speak of. And so that's an opportunity to educate the public not only on crop failures, but also on things like food miles about how, you know, it's so important to the environment to shop locally and seasonally because if you're buying a product at a grocery store, it might travel 1,500 miles, whereas produce grown at the market maybe traveled 25 or 50. So I would say use it as an opportunity to educate. And also, in terms of getting through this struggle, because I know it is a struggle, and maybe the first year or two you won't be able to participate in the FMNP program, but um, you can recruit vendors anywhere. I have recruited vendors at bake sales at churches, at schools. I have pulled over more times than I can count to a roadside stand and talk to a grower. You know, sometimes it's just somebody with a wagon full of cucumbers or whatever. Just talk to them, get them involved. And one thing I've found is really a great way to make that happen is to let people try the market for free. You know, for one day or a couple of weeks, whatever you decide, you can get vendors. Word of mouth, social media, you can definitely get vendors. Like I said, you might not qualify to get your market certified for FMNP the first year, but the first year is going to be tough anyway. So muddle through it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say about that. <laughs> I have good advice. It really, if at all possible, it is such a cleaner market for, for managing if you can do 100% vendor grown. Um, it, it, it's, it's it's easier on the vendors and it's easier on the market manager and, For sure. and you're very you're very right that the customers aren't so many of them don't even think about that they just assume that it's all vendor grown and uh, uh it's good advice but, but yeah, i realize there are many smaller communities out there that they seem to struggle finding enough vendors or to make it a viable market but if at all possible shoot for that 100 percent vendor grown it makes it for a uh, a more true version of what a farmer's market should be in my mind too so. paul and jennifer um just a uh going off of that a question any thoughts on how to certify the 100 percent homegrown Well, a lot of markets will actually put that in the rules that the market manager or somebody with with authority with the market has the ability to go on your farm, you know, I'm not saying they just show up unannounced, but to go on uh, participating vendors farms and view what's grown. And then they they see what's being sold and they can compare the two and be and rest assured you know, the, the, the vendor is selling what they are growing. So. One thing we do in my market to that end also is on our vendor contact form, we have them fill out before the season even begins the produce that they intend to bring. So if somebody says they are going to grow corn, squash, and watermelon, and then come June they're bringing, or July they're bringing in eggplants, that raises a red flag. And like Paul said, a farm visit is also in our rules. We say, you know, that we can schedule an annual farm visit, which I actually recommend that market managers do anyway, because it's such a great way to get to know your vendors, and it's a great way to promote your market. I like to take photos of what's going on at the farm. I do this by invitation. I don't just show up randomly, but a lot of my vendors do invite me out, and I, you know, 
can promote their business that way on our social media pages. Thank you guys. Let's see, there was a question on donating produce and that's a great question. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that, and but maybe Jennifer does. I do know that uh, probably a good resource for that would be the folks that eat Greater Des Moines. Um, uh, they have worked with doing these kinds of things, and they they even have participating in creating a a, a smartphone app called Chow Bank, C H O W B A N K, that tries to connect. Uh, folks and um, outlets with with excess food to agencies that could use that food to help the needy. So check that out. Um, Aubrey Alvarez at Eat Greater Des Moines. Her first name is spelled A U B R E Y. Um, you can reach her um, if you go to the Eat Greater Des Moines website. Just just look at that, and you'll find contact information. And I'll try and include that contact information in the response with the evaluation survey too. Do you have any insights, Jennifer, on that? I do, actually. I have a lot of experience with this. This is something okay. we do at our market. So I would say talk to your local food banks, and it could be your local church, a local shelter. Um, either I have, We have done this a couple different ways in the markets I've been involved with. At our Tuesday market here in Muscatine, I just, I collect whatever produce that the vendors would like to donate that day. They all know it. I don't go around and ask. They just know if they have anything they'd like to donate to drop it off to me. And then I drop it off at MCSA. It's our local shelter. Another option is that, um, well, we also have arrangements so that our growers can drop it off at any time through our local Jesus mission. There's a couple churches that we get involved with. But another option that we have found is useful is some of these organizations will show up at like, our Saturday market, and at the end of the market, they will show up, and the vendors can just take their produce directly to them. But I think it's a great thing to do, and our market has donated thousands of pounds of food, and it's also a tax break for the growers that are doing it. So there's a real good incentive there, especially when you're talking about produce that isn't necessarily going to hold until the next market, if that next market is four days away. So that's great. You just get the, the folks that want the food to show up huh, at the end of the market. Yeah, or the manager can drop it off too. Either way, yeah. we've done it yeah. both ways, and both ways work Great. wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Great. There was a comment along the same lines here um, from Gil, who said a few years ago, the University of Wisconsin Madison Ag Econ Department had a handout on the tax write-offs for donated produce. He did. He did mention though, um, it might be obsolete given the recent tax law changes, but that might be worth looking into too. And certainly, you know, for Iowa, not Wisconsin. Great. Um, well, here's one. Jennifer, you want to jump in? How to attract 30 to 45-year-olds? I was just looking at that one. I would love to talk about that. <laughs> that is the demographic we all want, and it can be challenging yeah. because that's the age where there's a lot of kid rearing, lots of weekend activities if your market's on a weekend. Um, so... What I would say is do anything you can to make your market an event, not just a place to get your groceries. And one of the ways in which I would suggest doing that is, I touched on this earlier, but applying for grants, if, you are, if your market is unable to afford certain things, um, some of the things that we do at my market is we have music. Every single weekend we have music because it just changes the atmosphere. It makes it more of an event. We get food trucks in there. Families that are busy don't want to have to worry about how, you know, how they're going to feed their kids that maybe on a Saturday morning. We have had, kids activities are a great way to reach that demographic. We have had puppet shows. We've had all kinds of craft booths. Um, 
we got a grant that allowed us to have a bicycle helmet giveaway and a bicycle safety check. We offer um, fitness classes like Tai Chi and yoga down at the market. Other things that I've found really helpful are find out what fun runs are going to be occurring in your community and see if you can get on that route. That is a tremendous way to get foot traffic in the market on that specific day, especially if you need to just increase awareness about your market dates and times of being on the route. It is very good for sales. Also, I would suggest teaching a skill. If you have someone who does weaving or things like that, get them down there. A specific cooking demonstrations are another good one. Also, I have found that giveaways attract people of all ages. This um, demographic not excluded. We often do market bucks giveaways. We do things like every year we have reusable bags created for the market and we give those away. There are, that is a challenging demographic because they're very busy. So what we have found is just make sure that there's always children's activities and um, just something going on. Collaborate with nonprofits in your area so even if you don't have the budget, to have an activity every weekend, you can work with people who might, who might have grant money to spend to have something neat go on, like a bounce house for a pack the bus event that's for school supplies. We've partnered with United Way on that before. So that is actually one of my biggest pieces of advice for market management in general is collaborate with other nonprofits because if you don't have the grant money to make something happen, you can work with someone who might. Great advice. Um, yeah, that's that's all really good stuff. I, I was remembering at the farmers market workshop that uh, the market manager from Maquoketa was touching on a lot of that too, Jennifer. And he actually went door to door to area businesses and asked for donations, and they set up some sort of account too, where the businesses would sponsor activities and maybe get their name on certain events during during the season, um, but they also created uh, an account to to fund coupons that were only good at the farmer's market at Maquoketa, and so they used those dollars to to get people to come down that, that might not have otherwise come. So, uh, Another question, Jennifer, LaVon is asking, yeah. where were those community grants or the grants coming from to help with some of those activities? The grants that I'm referring to come from our local community foundation. So if you can find um, something like that in your area or just work, like partnering with a nonprofit so that you are eligible for that. But in Muscatine anyway, we have a community granting foundation that you, writing a grant is not that difficult. You just have to um, write out a plan for how much money you need and what it will go to and then submit that. I can only speak for Muscatine here because I don't have any experience with this otherwise, but I would find out if there are any local local grant opportunities in your community. And you could probably find that out through the chamber or, um, well, that would be my first step as the chamber. Thank you. There's a question on what legal items do you need to do to be aware of in starting a new farmer's market? Um, you know, when it comes to the state, the state is rather hands off when it comes to farmer's markets. You don't have to register with the state. You don't have to get a license to have a farmer's market from the state of Iowa. Where really the state steps in to farmer's markets is on the individual vendor level. Uh, if that vendor is selling something that might need a license to be sold properly at a farmer's market, that's where the state gets involved. Where you, where you come into government play oftentimes with farmer's markets is at the local level. If you're gonna be on city property, then you need to work with the, the local city officials to make sure that everything's squared away, but, but there aren't any federal or state laws that say you can or cannot have a market in this location, but you'd want to 
certainly touch base with the local uh, authorities if you're on public property. I would just like to add in Muscatine, the two markets that I am affiliated with are Muscatine and West Liberty. And in Muscatine, all we have to do is get a city use permit because we do use city property. And there are no other fees or permits at all. And I was so surprised when we started up the market in West Liberty to find out that the market itself had to have a peddler's permit. It covered all vendors there, but that's just to show you that it varies from town to town. So definitely give City Hall a call and find out what you need. Jennifer, do you want to, oh, you were going to say something, Lynn? Just um, another another question that came in on our Q&A line was, um, has anyone experienced, this is from Laura Jones, has anyone experienced implementing the Power of Produce Club for kids? She says they register at the market and get $2 to buy fresh fruit and veggies. Hmm. We have not used You haven't used that, Jennifer? No, we haven't. Paul, do you have any information on that? I don't. You know, we, we have a... Um, some programs within the department along the lines of farm to school. Uh, Tammy Stotts does run a program with farmers markets in the state, if you're interested, where the kids do scavenger hunts at the markets and uh, they win a prize that's probably includes some fruits and vegetables. Um, but, you know, give us a call and Tammy Stotts can steer you in on how to, how your market can participate in, in that program. And um, Corrine Bonama, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name right, but it's um, she said she has used that in Minnesota last year. So we do have someone on the line um, who has experience with this. So Laura Jones, if you want um, more information uh, with Corrine's permission, I will. I could connect you to. Jennifer, I wanted if you wanted to touch bases on you, some, you know, you alluded to some struggles with the Muscatine market, and then you, I think you involved the mayor, didn't you? I did. It. You're, yeah, Paul. Actually, I called Paul I, it, when things kind of came to a head, and we were struggling. That rule, because I found it was just so impossible to enforce, especially with the FMNP program having regulations on how far produce can travel and things like that. So. Um, I did. I, I contacted the mayor and I asked for a letter of support. And I think it's really important for market managers to realize that we have so many more resources at our disposal than you might initially think. A lot of us are volunteers and that has emboldened me personally to ask other people for help. I figure if I'm volunteering my time to make my community better, certainly it's okay to ask other people to do the same. So I have done things like ask the mayor to help me to get that changed. And all, and all he did, you know, we went out to lunch and had a talk and he wrote a very nice letter encouraging the market members to um, make this choice collectively. And it worked. We, did it took two years of me trying to get that hundred percent vote to go through but it happened <laughs> but you know I mentioned earlier um, about like asking an attorney to help drop a hold harmless agreement and you know turning to the mayor and turning to churches I've turned to local churches to recruit musicians when we were unable at that time to afford musicians I just think that it's important for us to realize that our market is a service to our community. It's something that betters our community. So don't hesitate to ask people and organizations to help if you have an area you're struggling with. And in, if you have access to it, and again, I'll, I'll send this out also, um, the power of produce information is in your chat window if you want to take a look at that. But again, I will, I will send more information on that too. And thank you, Corrine, for that. Okay, back to questions, Paul and Jennifer. Okay. And we have about uh, just a little under 20 minutes. Um, if we have more questions or, and you know, we can continue, people are just kind of 
um, jumping in when they have them. But if there are more questions, we can go ahead and keep going with those. Uh, there's a question here on, on best practices for choosing a time and location mm -hmm. and advertising. Um, I, you know, of course, each community is going to be different. A, a central location works very well, and you may have to you'd be on city property and work with the city for that. But, but there are markets out there that will use the parking lot of, say, the, the local hardware store, um, and there you would work with, with the owner. And you want to be sure to discuss certain things about the market, where it will be located in the lot, and and uh, touch on insurance. Um, but uh, I will say that based on all the markets that participate in the Farmers Market Nutrition Program, Saturday morning seems to be the most popular time to hold a market. Um, and there are good reasons for that, of course. So that that's a good time. I realize, though, that sometimes that's a, a time when other markets in your area might be holding uh, their markets, you know, so the communities are holding their markets at that time. So that's not always the best choice. I know that some communities around Des Moines struggle to have uh, customers participate in their Saturday markets because everybody runs to the Des Moines downtown farmers market uh, just as an event, you know, for Saturday morning. So they choose a different day. So you want to think about your surrounding communities and the markets that are being held then, uh, there and when. And it also ties up uh, vendors, you know, they, they're busy on those days maybe then. So you want to think of a, a free time to hold it where the vendors might be able to participate. You have anything, Jennifer? Yeah. Actually, everything that I had written down about that question, you covered. <laughs> oh, okay. But it's great advice. Do not compete. Don't even attempt to compete with a larger, more established market. Talk to vendors. You know, find out when they're free. Especially if you're a, in a smaller community, you just can't compete. Like with Des Moines or in my area, it would be Iowa City. When I was creating the West Liberty Market, we decided on Wednesday evenings because there are so many larger communities. Basically, every other day, day of the week was booked. Mm -hmm. And I would like to mention this. If you are working on establishing a new market, a great way to get vendors is to visit nearby farmers markets and communities. Vendors are always looking for other markets to explore. Absolutely. So that's a great resource. Don't forget about that. Jennifer and Paul, one question I have kind of along those lines, and I've heard this from many of the people, I'm not, I'm not involved with a farmer's market, but um, what about places where there are maybe multiple farmer's markets and it's a smaller community or they're smaller markets and neither one of them really are doing just you know, they don't have a corner on the market or it seems like it's almost more competitive than collaborative. Is there any way to build bridges to try and, or is there any reason I should say, maybe there's always a way to do it, but any reason to only have one farmer's market in a community or do you think it's okay or better to have multiple? Well, I would say in part it based on the population of the community. Um, but I know of instances where really I think a community could only support one market and they have two. Um, and that often has arisen because of uh, personality conflicts. Okay. And so markets will split. There will be such a division that half or more of the vendors will walk away and start a separate market on a separate day. Um, these are un unfortunate events. Unfortunately, they don't happen all that often, but they do happen. And these rifts are very hard sometimes to overcome. Um, you know, it, it, it can take a, a strong market manager to go convince the others to come over. Um, oftentimes, there is just one or two vendors, though, that don't want to play nice, if you will. And... Uh, I know of instances where they've been excluded from the markets just because 
the, the, of the personality conflicts. Okay. Any other questions that you guys have that were on the previously asked list? Well, there is, I think there was some question about advertising. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer, do you, do you want to touch on how you use Facebook and, and social media? I, I would love to. Social media, Facebook in particular, because I feel like it is probably the best platform to reach the greatest audience. I have found that Instagram and Twitter are not nearly as useful to um, the demographic that we're looking to reach, which as was mentioned is the 30 to 45 year olds. Facebook is an invaluable tool. One thing that we often do on Facebook is we run ad campaigns. It is a really inexpensive way to reach just huge numbers of people. For a $5 ad campaign, you can reach thousands of people in, Mus in Muscatine we're able to. So I would strongly recommend that. It is so easy to hold promotional events and contests on Facebook. Asking people to like or share a post is a great way to spread the word. We often create event pages for if we're having, you know, we might create an event page for opening day. And that way people are able to invite their friends and family members to the event. Um, let's see. One thing that I find really useful, I do this all the time on our Markets Facebook page, is um, infographics or posters, flyers, any really neat eye-catching design that you can create, it's a great way to get um, shares. So, for instance, last week I made one for the Muscatine Area Farmers Market with our new season dates and times, and um, also just, I, I mean, yeah, anyway, our new season dates and times. And there are some free, if you don't have any um, graphic design software. There are some free websites that you can utilize. One is canva.com. You can create customized um, infographics and images for your social media account. And then also, it's called postermywall.com. That has the biggest selection of um, free designs and templates that I have seen. And we get comments on them all the time. <laughs> so I would suggest utilizing that and hmm, that's all I can think of right now regarding Facebook. That's great. Oh, how do, one how other do you thing I did think of. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Paul, what? Oh, I was just going to say, do you use other forms of advertising? We do, actually. Um, we put up flyers throughout the community. This season, for the first time, I know a lot of um, a lot of towns in Iowa have a like main street area where you can put um, banners on the streetlights. We'll be doing that for the first time this year. We also print out um, like postcards or business cards to pass out at the market. One thing that we like to do during National Farmers Market Week is to put um, a postcard with a free item of produce listed on there under windshields around town so people can bring that to the market and redeem that. Um, hmm. That's great. For advertising, I think that that covered. Oh, and, and then um, also, I do write a column in our local newsletter. It's called The Voice of Muscatine. It goes out to everyone in the county. But I would suggest talking to your local newsletter, newspaper, whatever, and seeing if as a manager you can write a weekly column about what's seasonal, what's fresh, what's going on event-wise at the market. And there are always free community calendars to get your events listed on, or even just the fact that you're having a market. Mm -hmm. So definitely contact the chamber or your radio station or whoever might have one of those community calendars and make sure you're listed. Can you guys see um, on the... Michael was asking postermywall.com and what was the second one? It's called Canva, um, C-A-N-V-A.com. And I just put that in there.
Okay, any other questions? Well, one of the questions, we don't really have to get into this too in depth. It was about um, basically tips on having a successful market. And I think that a lot that Paul has said already touches on that. But there are a few things I would like to mention. Um, I said partnering with community organizations and let's see, in Muscatine, we do food and cooking demos with United Way. That's a way we partner. We do a pack the bus school supply drive for children and that is a huge event. We do a partnership with Senior Resources. They have a Kansas City sponsored barbecue competition every year and it's not part of the market, but we partner with them in a way that we shut down the street. We have to work with the city, of course, and shut down the street next to our market. Anything, anybody you can partner with to increase foot traffic at your market, either by sharing space with them or sharing you know, nearby proximity with them is a good way to get foot traffic at the market. But also, I would say for a successful market, you need a strong manager. There are always going to be conflicts at the market. There will be, as Paul mentioned, personality conflicts. There will be people who think that they can skirt around the rules. So you need a strong a, a manager who's not afraid to say, hey, that's not allowed. You can't do that. You need um, good advertising. You really, at this point in the game, cannot have a market, a successful market, I feel like, without a social media presence. It's the cheapest, most effective means of getting information about your market to the community. I would say keep activities going at the market. Always try to have at least one fun thing going on at your market per, you know, per market. And another thing that I would mention is on both my markets, under the rules and regulations, I always mention that it's in our rules that we're a team, act as a team member. Mm -hmm. And I would do whatever it takes to strengthen that. So many times our vendors look at each other as competition rather than as a team. And one thing I hammer home Every, every season at our preseason meeting and throughout the season as I need to is when another vendor at the market thrives, we all benefit from that because I've noticed that if we get a new, a new vendor, you know, that generally raises some eyebrows, people think, oh gosh, competition. But one thing that you should always remember is this is a new vendor. They have their own friends and family who are going to want to come visit them at the market. If they succeed and if they're drawing people to the market, we all benefit from that because although they might be buying produce from their friend and family member, they, you know, might be buying soap or plants or baked goods from one of our other vendors. So I would do whatever it takes to keep that team mentality strong, even if it involves things which I have done, like team building exercises before the market. <laughs> cool. Great advice. Really good advice. Any last thoughts before we wrap up? This has been extremely Interesting for someone who does not manage. I, I go faithfully to my farmers market, but um, this has really been helpful to, to listen to um, Does anyone else online have any last questions? Um, Paul and Jennifer is it okay if I mean Paul you've made your um, Contact information available Jennifer. Can I share your information also? Absolutely, I'm happy to help Great, then folks, I will make sure that you have that information. Paul, um, if I can have access to your um, PowerPoints, that uh, slides, that would be really helpful too. Um, sure. And clearly folks, if you take any inf information from that, um, just if you use it in any way, always make sure you attribute back to Paul and uh, the Department of Ag. But, um, well, well, it's this been a great opportunity, Lynn. Good. I really appreciate it. I'm really glad Jennifer could join me. Thank yes, you, thank Jennifer. you both for having me. Yeah, this was wonderful. So, um, yeah, any, any final thoughts, Paul or Jennifer? Well, I hope it's a good growing season, and I hope it's a great market season. Uh, it's always an exciting time, you know, just before things really get started. And um, 
really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, feel free to contact me, and I know Jennifer feels the same way if you have any questions. Great. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thank you again so much, you guys. Um, to those on the line, we will be sending out, I'll be working with um, our evaluator, Arlene, who I believe has been on the, on the line, and we, we always send out a short survey. Um, that is partly to help us just learn what, what we did well, what the speakers did well, what was helpful, what could have been more helpful, and then some, some topics you'd like to learn about in the future. Um, we're also always open to you hosting, or to, we would always hold space if you want to have peer conversations uh, amongst yourselves and, and not necessarily have a speaker. So if there's a topic that you would just like to talk to other peers about, please let us know. And there's a strong possibility that that'll be happening this fall at the Regional Food System Working Group meeting. So some more opportunities in the future for you to continue to work and talk to each other. Um, so look for that in the next week. Look for the survey. And then uh, I will try and submit the contact information and um, Paul's uh, PowerPoint slide. And then I'll send you the links to a lot of the things that we talked about today. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. It looks like we've got sunshine and warmer temperatures, so um, enjoy. Thanks again, Paul and Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you.